Good morning, Catholic YouTube. City of the Immaculata, Brian with you here. Today we are going to be discussing marriage in the medieval world. And I I really feel like I need to begin a discussion like this with a few disclaimers from, from the get-go. First, I am going to say that given the nature of this topic, this is probably not one for the children. My assumption is always to say that when it comes to topics of marriage or gender roles, that it's probably mostly for adult ears anyways. Even if I, you know, truly refrain refrain from explicit talk here, there's still a wide chasm between what the medieval people considered acceptable and what we do or even like appropriate for, for public discussion. But to peek into their world, to understand them a little bit better, you have to be willing at some, willing to look at some things that may be a little bit uncomfortable for you. Second, and I'm afraid that, again, due to the nature of the growing divide, I've discussed this before, but the divide that seems to be taking place between the sexes, I could anticipate some of the comments that may come my way from those who could potentially misunderstand my position on these matters. Right away, I want to say that I'm absolutely against and i despise the war between the sexes that's taking place in today's discourse you know it's been it's been bad for a while but it honestly does seem to be one area that has gotten excessively worse in recent years i understand that ideological differences can and do lead to confrontation right that's its own thing and i get that but the way the especially well the way that the left historically divided politics by identity but it's also something that the right's engaging in recently as well black versus white rich versus poor man versus woman if you guys have ever wondered where i stand on these things I don't really concern myself so much with what non-Catholics are up to, give or take, depending on the issue. But there's there are different, very different approaches that I take to the different groups of people. I'm way more interested in intra-Catholic dialogue, what's happening among Catholics. And my one real criteria is in that discussion, are you Orthodox or not in your beliefs? If you are, I don't care if you are left, right, rich, poor, man, woman. I don't really care so much about any of that. But within, you know, Catholic circles, as a result of the influence by the wider culture, I think that some of the lessons, for example, that young men are taking away from what they are learning about women even if there's elements of truth at times in these realities, the lessons themselves that are, seem to be kind of taken from it are not really good, and they're going to lead to some very bad outcomes eventually, probably sooner rather than later. Now, there are some who I think are making very trollish rounds online in all different circles, be they Catholic or not. And to be fair, I think that most of that stuff is just controversy mongering. And who knows if these people actually really believe the nonsense themselves. It seems that when you take a deeper look into some of these things, the people that like are pushing these controversial narratives don't actually um, take the advice that they give out. But I remain hopeful that you know many young people will not buy into the nonsense about things like, you know, one that I saw that was making the rounds recently is that men will just naturally sort of lose attraction for their wives as the wives get older. And look, that one in particular, I mean, for you young guys out there, it's just some of this stuff is so atrociously bad takes. And that was just utter trash, right? Like I love my wife more and am more attracted to her now than I was when we met in our 20s. And that's just the God's honest truth. 
she'll never see this. I'm not saying this, you know, to get brownie points from her. But for one thing, it seems like many of these people making these comments just have no concept, apparently, of marriage as a sacrament. But also, like, there's a real beauty to women who age gracefully and naturally. Now, the ones who are trying to, like, reconstruct their faces and bodies constantly to make themselves perpetually 22, they end up looking like a picture of Dorian Gray, admittedly, all right? But the women that kind of let themselves age naturally, you know, taking care of themselves along the way, but age naturally, really end up looking quite beautiful in their own way, in my opinion. The other thing that's all so frustrating about this is that it's so unbelievably unnecessary. I heard Jordan Peterson say, and I'm not like the biggest fan of Jordan Peterson, but he says some good things every once in a while. And I heard him say that the sexes have managed to get along fairly well through the centuries, through some of the most harsh, destitute of times that you oh you millennials and you zoomers out there will never even begin to comprehend what they the struggles that your ancestors went through let's just leave aside all the spiritual talk for a moment right you are born i mean just think about this fact right you are born into this universe this world you are literally thrown on a giant rock that's hurtling through space and the vacuum of space at that, you can't even like safely get outside of it. And all around you is evil of the most contrived to the most vacuous. And even if you're born right now today, right, the loss of this, this friend of mine's daughter is just a testament to this. Even if you were born today and you live for, a, you know, a long life for a hundred years, it's still a very short, fleeting thing that's mostly filled with tears and misery. Now, to bring the spiritual in, as spiritual people, we believe that we, we are hopeful wayfarers. But the reality is that this is our lot. <laughs> For millennia, men and women have done a pretty damn good job, and excuse my language, but we've done a pretty damn good job of making this otherwise miserable short existence work harmoniously with understanding and respect for one another. You know, our ancestors carried on not just themselves, but the species. The entire human race is alive today, and it's we stand as a testament. We stand on their backs. And look at us here today, right? It's so tragic and pathetic. With more than they ever had, yet we are coming to these utterly, like, uh, egregious like views of how we're the other sex just does us wrong and they're so manipulative and evil and this is from both sides right both sides it's a real misunderstanding so i hope that by giving you some insight you know this is a series of videos that we're doing on the medieval church and the medieval people that by looking at this small group of people right medieval europeans that maybe it could help you see things from a different kind of perspective now, again, I want to be clear that though these people are not perfect by far, they were not necessarily the ideal, but they had some takes that are worth discussing and ruminating in your mind and thinking about, and maybe even at times pitting against our own presuppositions. You know, I will be saying and covering things here, and I don't want to make it seem like I'm giving a blanket endorsement of this stuff, but it's intended to kind of make you think. And there's so many, so many facets and fascinating areas that I would want to take this, but I want to do I want to do several things here. I want to give kind of a purview of how the idea of marriage as a sacrament develops in the West, in the High Middle Ages, and how it corresponds to certain philosophical changes that take place, often at times at odds with the prevailing views of gender that existed within a given culture. Which gets me to an obvious but kind of necessary to express point that across different parts of Europe over different time spans, attitudes shift and change, right? So the 11th 
century Italy isn't necessarily going to look like 11th century England or 11th century Italy isn't necessarily going to look like 15th century Italy for that matter. And these, these, these things are fluid. And I think we oftentimes, because when you're 500, 600, a thousand years removed for something, it's oftentimes to see the difference between say the 11th century Europe versus the 12th century Europe or even the 13th century and so on. The other thing is that we are trying to get at here is that the average life, excuse me, the life of the average person, not many people bother to write about them. One instrumental concept, one of the sort of master keys of this whole discussion that you must grasp when it comes to this or really any subject pertaining to the Christian story You'll very often hear people say, especially today's dialogue, you know, oh, you Christians, you're just hypocrites. And you never, you know, Christians, they never live up to societal stand ethical standards. The problem with that is that the standards by which we judge Christians is ones that is standards that came about as a result of Christianity itself. And I was going into this conversation last week or the week before, whenever it was, and my audio cut out, but I was talking about Ayan Hirsi Ali, and I will get back to that that video at some point. I'm sorry for the audio that cut out. But the problem with that is, for example, most people in the 21st century would agree that it's wrong to leave unwanted infants out to die of exposure. We, it's kind of a general a consensus among people for that. But the moral precept of that is not something that we can presume. It's not a given. When you go back into society of the dominant culture as Christianity is coming about, the people then didn't necessarily think something like that was wrong. In fact, it was just something that we did. The reason we know this is because while the practice is happening, no one at the time is actually bothering to critique it. That is until the Christians come along and say that what you're doing is wrong. And even then, it takes time for society to actually make these changes. It actually takes generation for certain milieu to give way to new ethics. I'll give you another example, slavery. The surprising thing about slavery is not that and it existed in antiquity. The surprising thing about slavery is that no one bothered to question it ever. Not until the fourth century when you have two saints separate from one another, but about the same time who come to the same conclusion, Saints Gregory of Nyssa and St. Augustine of Hippo, putting all the sort of pieces together of a systematic theology of what this gospel message presents to us, that for the first time in human history, we begin to think like, oh, may maybe, this, maybe this thing is actually wrong. But again, just because some holy Christian comes along and comes to this realization, that doesn't mean that all nations, even all Christian nations, will just overnight magically change to this new, this new idea of being formulated. There are long-held biases and prejudices rooted deep that will continue despite the best efforts of the church to attempt to pull humanity out of the filth and disgust in which we have been these like ways which we've been treating each other in our environment since time immemorial. And don't even think that a Christian society itself has it all down pat ever. Oftentimes what happens to that cultural norms, the pre-Christian ones especially, survive right alongside the Christian church as it attempts to reform the culture. So often I see, especially among secular traditionalists, but but Catholic traditionalists as well are these people who just are ignorant of these kind of realities. You know, they want to justify a practice of the past without ever considering if it was ever really a Christian practice at all. But that's its own thing. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a bit. But when people, especially Western secularists, they're the worst at this, when they come along today and they claim that we could uphold some system of ethics built over centuries and centuries of a very unique Christian mindset, mores that the church had to wrestle and fight for over centuries to change, 
and to bring about a cultural achievements in these areas, it's so appallingly bad and ahistorical when people sort of set up this premise that these sort of things just exist in the ether world and people would all of a sudden have come to these conclusions sans Christianity. And it's actually rightly pointed out, I think, in sort of modern academia, you're starting to see rumblings of this, and hopefully it becomes more more evident that it, this is kind of just another example of Western colonial thinking from secular leftists who who engages in, at times, this I, this idea that all cultures are just like us, that there's really nothing unique about Western Christian culture. Secular leftists will arrogantly and snidely tell other cultures, like their children, that, you know, oh, no, you're not actually what you think you are. You're actually just like us. And, you know, don't you dare question me on that. All of this is to bring me about to today's topic, marriage and gender roles. And I know, guys, I take a little while every single time to actually get to the topic at hand, but it's just my style. I want to set up the playing field before we begin the game. In today's game, I want you to kind of see three, three different things. There's the culture of marriage as it exists excuse me, as it existed already in the world. Then there is the church that comes along and wrestles with certain questions about marriage and eventually makes pronouncements. And then there is this long process of the church lifting humanity out of that filth and elevating it in ways that subsequent generations come to take for granted, as we see today. And actually, the easiest place to begin with in this subject, in my opinion, is with church pronouncements. Because for the first several centuries, there aren't many, not in a definitive way, pronouncements coming down from the magisterium about marriage. You know, I spent some time before, you know, going live, going through some of the systematic index in Densinger and just ordered and highlighted the church's pronouncements on the sacrament of matrimony up to roughly, I believe, the Council of Trent is where I stopped. Once you get to Trent, you know, you in the Catholic reforms, you really begin to see a much more, much more official statements being said from the magisterium. But before Trent, though, there's not a whole lot. And I wanted to take just a few excerpts for you guys today. from Denzinger, just to kind of get a look at what the church is very early on saying about the sacrament of marriage. So from Denzinger 88, we have Pope, excuse me, Pope Saints 384 to 398. And he gives us, as far as Denzinger gives, the first official pronouncement on Christian marriage that we have. And this is what it says. But you have inquired concerning the marriage veil, whether one can receive in matrimony a girl betrothed to another. Let this not be done. We prohibit it in every way, because if that blessing which the priest gives to the bride is violated by any transgression, it is like a kind of sacrilege among the faithful. So very, very first official church pronouncement, we have Pope Sericius writing from the in the epistle to Himerius that you should not receive in matrimony a woman that is betrothed to another person. So the very first thing we're looking at, you'll notice, is v- the validity of marriage, right? Next, we're going to look at Denziger 307, and that jumps ahead a quite a ways. 307 is... Is it 307? Bear with me, guys. I got to pull up the index here. Maybe I meant 301. 
Okay, yes, 301 rather, not 307. So 301, it says, this is from the Eras of the Adoptionists. This is Pope Hadrian. No, excuse me, Predestination and the Various Abuses of the Spaniards. This is an epistle to the bishops of Spain. Dearly beloved ones, in regards to the diverse chapters with which we have heard from those parts, namely that many saying that there are Catholics living a life common with the Jews and non-baptized pagans. As in food, so would drink, or in diverse eras, say that they are not being harmed. And that which has been practiced, for although it is not permitted for anyone to marry an infidel, lest they bless their daughters with one, and so they are entrusted to a pagan people, and that without examination these aforesaid priests are ordained in order that they may preside, and also another great deadly error has grown strong, that although the husband and living, these false priests choose women for themselves in marriage. And at the same time, we have heard from these parts about the liberty of the will and many other things which are too numerous to mention. So we have priests taking up married women. So again, sort of an illicit act happening there. And then I have Denzinger 367. Let's see. This is from This is from the second So this is this is quite a bit of a jump from from the first one to the third one. We have Pope Innocent II 1130 1143 the Lateran Second Lateran Council in 1139 and he says or the canons of this council say Canon 23 those, moreover, who pretend a kind of piety condemn the sacrament of the body and blood of the Lord, the baptism of children, the sacred ministry, and other ecclesial orders, and the bonds of legitimate marriages, we drive as heretics from the church of God. Dot, dot, dot. And I want to take a minute here to, to look at Second Lateran Council of Innocent IV, because he was unique. This, well, first off, we, we when we get to the Second Lateran Council, this is the period where the church definitively for the first time defines that there are seven sacraments, which includes the sacrament of marriage. Now, Pope Innocent III, unique character, no doubt. I'll probably be doing something on Innocent III at some point because he's just such an important pope for the high Middle Ages. But he has this funny little letter that he writes to men this is when he was not Pope. This is when he was still um, a cardinal, I believe. And he's writing to men about whether or not they should consider marriage or the consecrated life. And it's quite humorous. So I want to read this to you. This is from a chapter of his entitled On the Misery of the Continent and Married. So he gives, I think, 10 different reasons why we should avoid marriage, why men should avoid marriage. One, a wife competes to have the most expensive dresses and act accoutrements so that the upkeep of the wife always exceeds her husband's fortune. Two, in general, she sighs and cries day and night and gossips and grumbles. Three, she'll say of another woman, she is better dressed and can go out in public and is honored there by everyone, while I am most miserable and the only one to be looked down upon in the gathering of women and am disparaged by all. Four, she only wishes to be loved only she to be praised. Praise of another is treated suspiciously as a disgrace to herself. Five, everything she loves is to be loved and everything she rejects is to be hated. Six, she wishes to win, but her victory is worthless. <laughs> Seven, she cannot bear to serve, but strives to dominate. Eight, she wants to be allowed to do anything and not be prohibited from anything. Nine, she is beautiful. If she is beautiful, it is easy to fall in love with her. And if she is ugly, she will willingly do her best. But it is different to keep hold of what is loved by many and troublesome to possess what one wishes not to have. Ten, you can try it out before you buy a horse, an ass, or an ox, or a dog, clothes, or a bed, or even a cup or a jug. But a wife is only glimpsed with difficulty so that she might displease before she is taken. Whatever might come about in the end, she must keep by necessity, even if she is fat, stinky, ill, idiotic, or even proud or irascible, or even if she is corrupted by blemish, end quote. 
I'm tempted to let all of that stand without commentary. <laughs> I think uh, Pope Innocent III would probably concede that many of these points would apply for men, excuse me, for women discerning marriage as well. But point being that there's always been a preferential move within Christianity towards life, the life of consecration and celibacy over the married life. And there are many reasons that which many reasons for that, which we may or not have time to get into today. But for now, I continue. OK, I'll give one last one here. I've got. 465 from second Leon's again. Let's see, 465. Uh, excuse me, that's not so. The first one was Second Lateran. This one is Second Leon. So in the future, this is Pope um, Gregory the Tenth. The same Holy Roman Church also holds and teaches that the ecclesial sacraments are seven, namely one baptism concerning which we have spoken, another is the sacrament of confirmation, which the bishops confer through the uh, imposition of hands when anointing the reborn, another is penance, another the Eucharist, another the sacrament of orders and another is matrimony another extreme unction which according to the doctrine of saint james is given to the sick uh, a little bit further but concerning matrimony it holds that neither one man is permitted to have many wives nor one woman many husbands at the same time but she the church says that second and third marriages successively are permissible for one freed from a legitimate marriage through death or the of the other party if the canonical impediment for some reason is not an obstacle. Okay, so it's second Leon's, excuse me, second Leon's upon which we have in 1274, at the height of the medieval period that we are discussing today, that the church pronounces that there are seven sacraments. So as I'm reading these, and there are several I've admitted for time's sake, but you may be thinking like, wow, okay, so the church is like hyper-focused on the validity of marriage over their efficacious sign as a sacrament. But this is actually a really important point to note, especially when you're thinking about the sort of ethical framework we function under today. Now, while there are certainly some good treatments on marriage in the early church, we have, I think I put it up, but we have somewhere the homilies of St. John Chrysostom on, on marriage. There's still not much written in this sort of, like a sort of beautiful flowery style that you would get from later, especially from like a Pope St. John Paul II on marriage, or even like a Bishop Fulton Sheen or something like that, where the church, you know, especially starting in the 20th century, really begins to develop the sort of idea of marriage and how how marriage is efficacious for us as as a grace but as far as the validity goes while you may think that is like the church just being its overly legalistic self as we're often accused of without realizing it and in some ways you know the me too movement though i'm sure most of those people would consider themselves far superior to those intellectually barbaric churchmen of the Middle Ages, but they themselves in many ways are the inheritance of a Christian ethos, even here, because the ideas of consenting parties are once again by far not a given. The reason, the very reason consent exists as an idea of bodily autonomy, be that for sexual license or anything else, is because A, the Christian church worked out in its ecumenical councils and doctrinal pronouncements what a person is. And this goes every everything from, you know, the early church, you know, from the ecumenical council of Nicaea, dis discussing the personhood of the Trinity and of Christ, all the way up to like in the high Middle Ages with the scholastic period, you know, all the way up to somebody like Scotus with concepts of hoxiety and individualism. Personhood alone in itself is not a given. Mao's, if you dare you think that it couldn't easily be undone, Mao's communist China, for example, experimented in assigning people numbers instead of names because names Im implicitly imply individuation where if all there is is this sort of 
uh, mechanistic atheist universe that the Communist Party believed in, then the idea of you as an individual is but a mirage, right? It's a social construct, as they like to say. But then B, the church in her, quote, obsession with the validity of matrimony determines over time that it's actually spousal consent is one of the defining factors in what makes a marriage sacramentally valid in the eyes of the church. In fact, this is why we have customs that carry down to our very own day in the sort of rubrics of the marriage ceremony. We're all married in front of witnesses because there was a problem in the medieval church where these couples would like these young, these young couples would like run off into the woods and they would come back married. Then years later, you know, the husband may just decide that, you know, I don't actually like this woman anymore. But yeah, we were actually never married. That whole thing was a lie, right? So to determine that a marriage was legally binding, you'd have to have witnesses. As well, the ancient custom of reading of the bands. While we don't do that in the States, many still call out during the wedding if there are any who object to the couple marrying. And did you ever kind of like wonder where that came from? It's not, it's not like, no, it's not because of like Dustin Hoffman rushing in to come away and take the bride in some like silly romantic sense. It was to give the public witnesses a chance to come forward and put forward problems, barring the couple from being badly married, including say like lack of consent. Now recall those three points I wanted to you to take from these, right? You have these like traditional notions of things like arranged marriages deeply steeped in human culture. Then you have the Christian church working out over time alongside the culture, the concept of spousal consent and ideas of how a marriage is valid. And these are two separate things and they're operating at opposite poles at opposite ends of sort of the spectrum and operating concurrently. And at the same time, the existing cultures, while they're doing their thing, the church is working out the bounds of a doctrine and then slowly introducing those doctrines into the culture. So many people at these junctures, junctures are tempted to think like, oh, these like ethical mores of Christianity should have just been clear from like the year 100 forward, right? Like all of you Christians should have had it all figured out and all of these things should have been known and followed and enforced on society. You know, you got your Bible and your ethics. Why, why were Christians still treating people badly in the year 400 or the year 1150 or the year 1890 for that matter? But even as the church said, okay, this is what we have decided about marriage and consent. The culture takes time to catch up, if it ever does. And it's not a given that the culture does catch up. I know of, we'll say, arranged marriages, though they were actually really forced marriages. Some, some friends of mine who had family in the old country talked about how their grandmothers and great-grandmothers were in sort of enforced marriages. And unless you, you know, critics, and these aren't Catholic, historically Catholic countries, you know, and unless you critics out there think that the church should just have an enforcement arm, there's not much that we can do to impose these standards on a culture. The general trend has been to sort of let these things take place over time, general trends, generational trends. Now, one thing to start transitioning this conversation over to the discussion of gender roles, something related to marriage is the age old practice of the dowry. Now I've heard some modern reworking of this to kind of put like a feminist spin or friendly light on it, that the dowry was a familial deposit that the woman's family would put down to ensure that in the event of the husband's death, the husband's family wouldn't leave the, the daughter destitute or without some kind of financial re recourse. And there's, you know, there's truth to that, but it's by far not the principal reason for the dowry. The principal reason for it, and I'm sorry, oh, ye modern women who, you know, have your sort of pre presupposed ideas of what the Middle Ages were like, 
or histor the history of the world was like in general, is that women were a financial burden to a family. Throughout most of human history, up to the Industrial Revolution, really, and even then, really not until the invention of the assembly line and when World War II lost a huge portion of its manpower to the conscription, historically, men were prized, not because they were somehow like inherently better or they were seen that they were had more worth and dignity, but they were more prized because their manpower, right? Their, their actual physical manpower could be better exploited. So a family that had to survive off of hard, harsh, physically debilitating labor could better sustain itself with a larger cohort of men over women. So, you know, as, as a lord of the land, I wanted production. As a family living on the Lord's land, I had to produce. In order to produce, I needed the physical strength that men provided, and the work expected of men was grossly disproportionate to that expected of women. So let's say I have job A, right? Job A that needs to be done. Well, that job requires, let's say, on average, five men to get the job done. Then I have job B, and job B can be done by like two women. Both job A and B both need to be done for our family or our village or whatever to function properly and orderly, yes. But the ratio is vastly disproportionate in both the type of labor and the number of individuals needed. So then my son wants to marry, right? He's one of my five men that I have. But I already have a wife and I have a daughter who's not of age, both of whom are handling job B for me just fine. It would be a financial burden for us to take on another woman. So... I'm gifted with the, the family's gifted with the dowry. Then she as a daughter will be expected to provide my son with sons again, not because they're like greater dignity. Like your average peasant isn't thinking, you know, Oh, patriarchy because he wants to own women. It's because the sons made it possible to keep your inheritance. And because sons could work the land, the family was renting from the Lord's. And legally, the Lord's class, you know, you would pass on your inheritance of the land to your son. Now, I want to point out here, too, that this was really has nothing to do with the church, per se. This is just how society functioned. And honestly, this is how society has functioned through most of history. Women were just burdens, not because of anything that it had to do with who you women are as persons, but because of the work that you were or weren't able to do. Now, as far as roles, qua roles go, gender roles, this is really interesting because medieval people in some ways lived in a world that would look topsy-turvy to us. I can't say, you know, I'm not much of a student of modernity. I can't say exactly when these things began to change. I have an idea. Possibly some of these ideas began to change with the Protestant Reformation and with the coming of the Puritans and with the Victorian era, at least in the English speaking world. But many of the ideas of sex as gender and many of the stereotypes of the roles of gender have been kind of reversed in modernity than what you would have expected in the Middle Ages. And some people are quite shocked by how much this is so. But before I give you the example, I want to be clear that the sources that we have for these things, we always have to ask, right? Like when a person's writing something down, is this just the person's like sort of peculiarities coming through the pen? Or is this actually how things really were? Because we unfortunately don't know as much about the life of the vast majority of medieval people because no one was really writing about them. Most of what was written was about the upper classes of nobles and lords and monarchs. But keeping that in mind, right, there is a hilarious little pamphlet from the 12th century England that's very helpful because, well, it, it sort of perfectly illustrates how they viewed the sexes back then. And it's called the Urbanus Magnus or the, the Book of Manners. It's not very long, but the idea was to instruct young men and this is why it's so helpful because it gives us an idea it gives us a glimpse into what was going on sometimes in the lower classes because 
so in the 12th century, there was this rapid increase of wealth and social movement and the need for training and etiquette became very important because you have these men who are no longer just born into wealth. They're actually earning it. So they're coming from a lower class, working their way up to a higher class. And this book, this book of manners is addressing how these men need to learn the etiquette of the higher class. So a few of the things that this book takes for granted is that in preparing young men, we have to inform them of how women really are. And in the Middle Ages, women were seen as the ones with certain uncontrollable lusts and urges. And I kid you not on this, right? Where, where the trope today is that men are just dogs, right? And he can't, men can't keep it in their pants. And that women are the pure ones and the, and the, quote, gatekeepers of sex. Medieval men were like, no, nah, no, nah, women, guys, expect your woman to cheat on you. <laughs> expect her to always want it. Even when you're tied up with more important fares of the state or the house, she'll be nagging you for it. Now, the author does grant that men have certain needs, which is sort of an illustration at times of the reality of things, because he goes into the fact that if, you know, if you're a young man and you absolutely must do something for your urges and you go to a prostitute, just be sure to do it quick and get it done fast and get out of there. But the assumption is that if you do not meet the needs of your wife, and it's hardly possible that you will because women are insatiable, she will be getting it elsewhere. She will be getting it from, and I quote him here, quote, with a cook or a halfwit or a peasant or a plowman or a chaplain, such are the things that charm and delight women, end quote. But he also warns these young men to sort of look away from, quote, whatever your wife does, do not damage your marriage. The idea, the problem here is that as you're sort of rising up the ranks in this sort of transitory time, it could ruin your life and your reputation and your fortunes to call her out because it be, could become publicly known to announce, you're announcing it to everyone what she's doing. So your reputation is tarnished. So it's kind of like he's advising you, look, this is what they do. Just expect it and get on with things. And this even, you know, these, some of these things about how women behave is this sort of same for same sex relations as well. So like, look, when you, when you women want to say that things are like, we're just so awful for your sex in the past. Well, in many medieval places, there was no real punishment for women engaging in relations with women. Now, no one would tolerate it as a lifestyle. They had no idea of the notion of an intrinsic proclivity towards the same sex. But when it happened with women, being with women, it's just kind of how y'all were, right? There was no real, like, when you go back into the legal precedents in the early, in the medieval church, of the state prosecuting, there's no, there's not a lot about women in that. We know it's actually happening because we can go to sort of like penitential manuals and we see that priests are given like certain advice about what to say to a woman who's confessing that she's had relations with women. But as far as like prosecutions go, it's not really happening. It was actually the men, and in particular, without being graphic here, it was the effeminate men who were punished. And why were they punished? Well, because they were behaving in ways that was disrupting the natural order by behaving like women. In fact, it was kind of grounds for being ridiculed by your buddies, by your pals, if you were seen as a man that slept with a bunch of women. It was kind of like, hey, bro, that's kind of gay. <laughs> like, I mean, that's how they viewed it, right? Because that's what women do. Masculine men were seen as having better uh, control over their impulses. So, you know, how, how, how things have changed, how the optics have changed, you know, over time, have they not? So going back to the book of manners, right? He's giving advice to men who are propositioned by the Lord's wife. And he basically says, look, you're a peasant worker. 
Uh, you're worked your way up into the upper classes. She's exposed to you now. If she makes a pass at you, well, you're in trouble, dude. <laughs> I mean, you, you can turn her down, but she could come up with some kind of trumped up charges to bring against you. And she's a vengeful female. She'll likely will. If you give in to her, well, don't let the Lord catch you. The Lord is in the Lord of the manor. And he actually says it's it's in your best interest just to pretend like you're sick, right? Anytime she, if she tries to make a pass at you, just say you're ill. And I'll tell you another kind of interesting thing about all of this, right? The idea of romance as a thing, right? As a genre in the medieval period, it come well, for one, it comes out of the medieval period, but it begins with this thing called courtly love. And I'm not an expert in courtly love. It sort of began in the French court. But if you are tempted to think of like these romance and courtly love as like the OG simps, the, the original simps reciting your little poems to some fair maiden that's not going to like give it to you. Well, it's, it's a little more complex than that, right? Because much of the assumptions about the suitors in chivalric romance were that they were men who were wooing married women. And much of what was built around that notion and much of the assumption of other men was that if you were engaging in courtly love, you were sleeping with someone else's wife. I mean, even the Arthurian legends give us a hint at this, right? I mean, you have Lancelot and Guinevere having an affair against Arthur. So it's this like fear that like permeates the minds of medieval men. There was like something of an obsession with it that, that we, that, well, you know, she may be married to you, but what she really wants is this kind of like studly knight over there. But again, you know, how much of this is true versus how much of it is just this like inbuilt cultural distrust. I'm not for sure. It's hard to say really. And there were, and not to pick on the knights, because there were some actually very admirable traits with certain knights. Like I remember, so to be a knight and to be married, like, and to go off on a crusade or to fight in a war, you had to get a dispensation from your wife because you were leaving her and you could cause her to sin if she came to the need of needing the, the, mar the marital act. And so you would get a dispensation from her, but there's these like really like touching stories about how when knights come back and like they live, they survived, they come back home and they live the rest of their life and they're dying on their deathbeds. A knight would bring in his wife and on his deathbed, make a, an oath to her, you know, that he on his word and swearing on, on the, on by God that he had never been unfaithful to her when he had like left. Cause you know, you're going to the, the, the ports wherever you are, right, in the crusader lands or wherever you're going, and there's going to be temptations from women that have always been available in certain military ports. So he would make, and that's a serious thing, right? Like these people took their faith very seriously. So if you're on your deathbed, right, and you've done everything else, you've, you've, you've had your extreme unction, you've seen the priest, you bring your wife in, it's one of the last things you would do is tell her, I've been faithful to you this whole time. But overall, going back to the beginning, I do think that both sexes have managed pretty well to live together, right? Even with all of these absurdities that always exist in any time and culture, the church has really elevated marriage as an institution. And it's never been easy for either sex. There are certainly restrictions that held certain talents of women back historically, but so too for men. But that really has nothing to do with the institution of marriage and what marriage provided men and women in history. Most, most men could expect to live to 40, roughly. And, you know, if you're lucky, you had a few of your descendants survive. And even then, there's a good chance that your descendants were going to be raised by another man because 40 isn't very old. So there's a good chance that your wife would probably remarry. So you're incredibly blessed if you got to see your grandchildren or you got to see your wife grow old or as a wife, you got to see your husband grow old. So I have gone on here for almost an hour. I don't see any questions. I'm going to leave it at that. Hopefully the audio has been good. I tried out a few new things with this this time. Um, 
I want to come back to a few things on this particular topic that I think are pertinent and interesting, but looking at the time, it would just take me way too long. I would end up being here for at least another 30 minutes if I try to open another can of worms. But I just want to end this with, for those of you that like look at all of these people that are giving advice about traditional marriage or disparaging marriage, and it's just a lot of noise right now. It's almost hard to, it's almost hard to even like wrap your mind around how insane things are right now today. And I'm not trying to be like boomer on you, like, oh, back in my day, like back in my day, things were screwed up as well. Just we didn't have the internet with everybody plastering it all over the place, social media. So things have always been kind of screwed up. Marriage has never been easy. Gender roles have always been a challenge for us to to make sense of. And I think there's often been misunderstandings between the genders. And they're kind of flipped today than what they were back in the Middle Ages. But regardless of all of that, men and women have still managed to do some amazing things as a part as partners as as like teams together in this insane thing that we call life and the graces that come through it and i'm so glad the church has actually you know it would be way to, it would be go, going way into a different field to begin to talk about marriage say post trent when the church really begins but you do also have some some even before trent like you have aquinas Bonaventure, Scotus, you have these great scholastics writing some pretty beautiful things, even if it's in an academic way about marriage. So the church has been speaking on these things for a while. It's not like it hasn't. The majority of the pronouncements have been very like legal and kind of dry, you know, where at least from the 20th century forward, there's been some really great stuff and works written on marriage as a sacrament and how it helps. And so don't you know, guys, don't get discouraged out there. And women don't get discouraged either. Like, I, I know you, some of the women might be like a little bit like rolling your eyes if you've never heard about how medieval men wrote about you or how they thought about you. But the church has been pulling all of us up out of the filth of, hu you know, human existence since the time that Christ ascended to the Father and the Holy Spirit came upon the, the apostles and the church went out into the world. It's been trying to lift us and we we fight the whole way, right? Like we fight to stay. We're like we're like pigs. We're pigs rooting in 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 filth. And we fight to stay in our filth, no matter how much the church tries to pull us out of it. So, anyways, guys, that's all I got. I hope everyone enjoyed this. God bless you all, and I will see you next time. Thank you.